All right. <clears throat> so as we get started, um, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, several representatives from Bloomberg, which are going to be uh, leading the session today. So let's please give them our full attention. Uh, basically, they're going to go through the terminal demo, and also they're going to be here for some recruiting events. They're going to talk to you about those opportunities. So I'm going to turn it over to Christine from Bloomberg, and she's going to kick us off. Hey guys, how are you? Good. Good. Awesome. In the afternoon, I'm feeling a lot more energy <laughs> yes. from this group. Great. Got through the morning ones. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Christine Meyer. I am the campus recruiter for the University of Maryland. I just picked up to school. So you will see me throughout the course of September. Um, but thank you so much for having us in the classroom. We're really pumped to be here. I started with Bloomberg about three years ago in the campus recruiting division. and. I had actually learned about Bloomberg in a classroom setting, very similar to yourself. So I highly encourage you throughout this time to, you know, not only pay attention and participate, but really follow along because you never know what sitting in a classroom and following along on a Bloomberg terminal can get you in the long run. Um, so I know you'll be using it throughout the semester for your projects and some other presentations you might have. Uh, but we're really here for you. We're excited to make this an engaging, interactive, you know, opportunity for you guys and want you to learn a lot from it. Um, so I'll talk to you about some of the positions we have at the end of the session, but I will pass it over to my colleague, John, who will be conducting a lot of the terminal demo itself, and then Amanda and Jesse uh, as well. Cool. All right. How's everyone doing? Good. Good? good. Yeah. <coughs> There's more energy than the two morning. Nice. Yeah. Good. Very good. Um, so uh, my name is John Jaskula. Thank you for having me on campus. First time over here. It's very nice. Uh, so I've, I've been with Bloomberg for uh, 10 years. Um, just talking about it as we're coming over here. I got my little blue block at work that denotes 10 years. Uh, so I've been on Bloomberg for 10 years. Um, I started off on our equity index team. Uh, so it's a third party equity index uh, department responsible for basically all the indices that we see on the Bloomberg terminal, everything from your S&P 500 down to a lot of the local market indices um, and specifically custom baskets. We did a lot of custom indices uh, for the sell side banks um, and the Delta One trading desk. We, we built a lot of these custom indices for clients. I spent a lot of time with them. Um, I moved on I, for the next seven years or so. I was a team leader within the equity department. Um, so during that time, we've been in our, our Princeton location. Um, I've had various groups throughout that. One of the main areas that I had and functions that I'll show you is our EVTS platform. It's our event space. So it basically is a calendar showcasing you know, everything for a company as far as their earnings release and earnings call schedule. So I had that for a while, dealt a lot with the business side. Um, over the past year, I kind of migrated over to a new team that was starting. Um, does anyone use our normal estimates product, like EEB, EEO? Yeah, we'll show it. If you not, will after this. You will. You will after this. Um, but it's kind of an offshoot of that called of our deep estimates. Um, I specifically deal a lot with the sell side brokers trying to get their full models and research reports onto the Bloomberg terminal, uh, showcasing the benefit that the terminal has so that they can reach out to the buy side and be able to sell this uh, information. So um, that's basically my whole career over there. So, But we'll be going through the uh, terminal demo. Um, again, any type of questions that you have and everything, feel free to shoot it out there, but I'll let the rest of my colleagues introduce themselves and we'll jump on in. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amanda. Um, I graduated from here in May of 2016. Um, so I've been working at Bloomberg for a year now, full time. Um, I spent the summer prior to that, so summer 2015, interning at Bloomberg um, on the same team that I work on now. Um, I work in equity fundamentals, so that's like the kind of breadth of historical income statement, balance sheet, cash flow type data for publicly traded companies. It's taken off of like 10Ks and 10Qs. Um, um, uh, when I was here, I was in Phi Pi Theta, the business fraternity. Um, I did turf on and I was a finance and economics double major. Um, yeah, Jesse. <laughs> uh, hi everyone, my name is Jesse. I am also a UMD alumni, graduated in May of 2016. Um, I majored in finance and marketing, and while I was here, I was part of C, where we student entertainment events, as well as the Quest Honors Program at the business school. 
Um, I also interned with Amanda in summer of 2015 at Bloomberg in our Princeton location, um, which then led to a full-time offer, which started in September of 2016, so we are both hitting our one-year anniversary. Um, and I work in our fixed income department, specifically in syndicated loans, um, so covering loan agreements that come to us from all of the major banks, um, processing and maintaining all of that loan data and uploading it onto the terminal um, in a efficient and timely manner for our clients. Um, and yeah, that's much more. Cool. cool. All right. All set. Nice. All right. So we'll, um, we're going to jump in. I'm going to go through the terminal here. So we're going to really just start off with just some background uh, on the Bloomberg itself uh, of the terminal. Go to some higher level functions after that and kind of also dive into some more equity specific uh, functionality. Uh, but as we go through, if you have any questions, you know, please raise your hand. Uh, Amanda and Jesse will also be walking around along with uh, Justine. So if you have any questions or you know, even just logging in, you know, feel free to do that. This is your time as well, too. Uh, but yeah, I just like to, to kind of go through the terminal itself, go through their background, and kind of dig in some equity functions that hopefully you'll find useful, you know, throughout your class and you know things that you can kind of take away uh, with it. So and then, John, uh, yeah, I'm interrupt you real quick. Sure. So he'll be running a lot of functions through what we call the command bar at the top of the screen. If you all move your cursor there too, I encourage you for every function that he runs, follow along on your own terminals and run the same function. You'll get the most out of it that way. And then Jesse will also be up here taking some notes on some key functions that will help you throughout the semester. So those two things, running the function and two, taking the notes on what the function is and what it actually means, I think will be really beneficial for you in the long run. So please do follow along, ask if you don't know, if you don't know how we got to that screen, ask a question, we'll go back, we're totally fine with that. So. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, good point, good point. So yeah, definitely uh, follow along, like I said, over here to, to help out as well too, so. Um, so all of you have at least uh, been on the Bloomberg before, seen the Bloomberg, I'm assuming you got one right in front of you. All right, so what, what are some of the things you've used it for? What kind of information have you pulled off the Bloomberg terminal? Yeah. Oh, we've used it to calculate spread. Okay. You know, for a recent mm -hmm. only design. Nice. All right. Oh, wow. Right in right away with these guys. Good, good. All right. So what else? Yeah. Okay. Look at beta, right? Okay, and competitors, right? The relative value and competitors and what's in that industry. All right, cool. Good, good. Anything else? All right. Well, some specific piece of information, but I mean, there's a lot out there, right? I mean, the Bloomberg is a, a ton of uh, wealth of information, a lot of functionalities, and over 15,000 core functionalities that are out there. Uh, so I can pretend we, we know them all up here, but obviously we're here to help as much as we can. Um, but that's what the Bloomberg terminal really is, a lot of... Um, you know, third-party information, analysts, uh, analytics that we put on top of it, you know, used by our core customer base. We have over 325,000 core customers that utilize the Bloomberg Terminal to make decisions, all right? So they have a lot of information in there, news aspect to it, whether you're looking up on company-specific, whether you're looking up news, or maybe on the industry level, kind of tying that all together, it's all available on, you know, the Bloomberg Terminal. Um, I'd like to just kind of showcase, I usually just start off, I have like a quick video, in just about a two-minute long video uh, that really just kind of highlights a little bit of the history of the Bloomberg and then also just we'll pop up right here so we could just see this real quick and then we'll talk about it. talk about what we got in front of us and dump in jump into some functions so just take a second financial markets move at lightning speed to make informed decisions investors need data news and research that are accurate fast and relevant and they need special technology to analyze every possible risk, find the best opportunities, and communicate with colleagues and market players around the world. Today, Bloomberg puts all of this at professionals' fingertips, but it wasn't always the case. Michael Bloomberg founded the company with one core mission, to use the power of technology to bring transparency to capital markets, allowing everyone to see the same data at the same time. That transparency is crucial to making the global marketplace efficient, fair, and dynamic. Today, Bloomberg is one of the most influential and innovative companies in the world. Bloomberg has nearly 19,000 employees in 192 locations in 73 countries, including over 2,400 news and multimedia professionals and 4,000 technologists who are constantly creating new solutions. The company's core product, the Bloomberg Terminal, 
connects about 325,000 top business and financial decision makers, investment firms, corporations, commercial and central banks, government agencies, universities, and high net worth individuals. The terminal also serves as the global hub where investors come together to communicate and form communities. With content available in 11 languages, it is one integrated network combining market moving news, independent research, and unparalleled data across financial asset classes with world-class analytics and trading tools. Bloomberg also uses its deep technology expertise to help companies collect, organize, and distribute high-quality data throughout their business. Our trading and enterprise solutions enable companies to increase transparency, manage risk, and comply with fast-changing regulations. These are just some of the many ways Bloomberg is unleashing the power of information to help clients prepare for and move into the future. All right, cool. Yeah, I like to like to show it. It touches on a lot of uh, key parts uh, that we're going to mention as well, too. Um, I also like to show it because it's got that nice little clip of some of the old Bloomberg terminal that you might see in there, right? That one clip of Bloomberg there, and it's got the old Bloomberg box on the desk. Um, so this Bloomberg really started. I mean, it was just a piece of hardware on a desktop over there, really just bond prices on, really started with the bond prices. Um, it's evolved into a lot more. Um, it's more of a, it's obviously a software now that's, you know, on any PC that's in front of you. Um, the information that's gone on today is obviously exponentially increased, but, you know, looking back at where it came from in that piece of hardware, and also looking in front of you, what you see of your keyboard, it's a little different, right? There's, there's a few extra buttons on there. Um, and a lot of these keys on there were kind of like built around even with the original terminal as well too. So you have a lot of your yellow keys on top of the keyboard, which is a little different than a standard keyboard. And it really just helps drive you to which part of the terminal you, know, you want to go to. Uh, if you're pulling up Apple, you want to look up stock information and stock price, you'd be driving on that equity key. So you could type in the Apple ticker and hit in the, in the equity key and get to that space on the terminal. But maybe you're looking at corporate bonds that are available, or maybe you're looking at the management structure. Um, maybe you're just looking at commodities, all right? So these yellow keys help drive you to that particular area. Um, and think about from like some of the original building of the Bloomberg itself too, where there, you know, it was a lot of tab and enter and, and get to where you need to be, and it wasn't as many uh, mouse clicks and um, you know tabs, all right? So it's, it's come a long way, but we still have that keyboard. And there's a lot of hotkeys on the top as well too, like your IBs and your, MS, your messages. Uh, there's also the help key. If you hit that help key twice, you will literally get in touch with somebody to help you at Bloomberg. Um, all of us know very well, too, if it's something very specific to our area, we get that chat right on the screen. And no matter what we're doing, what group you're in, you have to pick that up right away and to be able to, to assist the client. Because uh, customer service is a very important part of the Bloomberg terminal. Um, paying a lot for each of those individual terminals that are there, so the customer service is, is paramount. Um, so, But that's that's kind of like the keyboard that you see in front of you and why some of those yellow keys are there. Um, you can feel free to be able to pull up a ticker and drive to that particular part of the Bloomberg terminal by utilizing that. Uh, the terminal itself really could be used in three main ways. When we log in right now, what you're looking at is really what we call like the core terminal. So you have these four main prompt windows that, that appear. And as Christine was saying before, the top bar over there, which is really our autocomplete bar. All right, so you have these four main windows that come up. You could go onto one of the windows like we have open right now. And you could just start typing right into that top bar. So if I start typing Apple, autocomplete is going to start pulling in all the different results that it thinks that I might want, right? If I'm driving down to the security section, you can see the top thing in the middle area, which is Apple, the security itself. And I could go click right on that and get into the security. Uh, maybe it's some type of function I'm pulling up or a search, but everything drives right off of this, this, this command line. Um, if you know the actual function that you want to go to itself, you could type it right in there and hit go or the enter key. But this, this drop down over here, the autocomplete as we call it, is really just kind of like your lifeline to be able to search through the terminal, all right? And on the core terminal itself, these are the four main prompts that come up, and this is your window into whatever area of the terminal that you need. Um, along with the core terminal, the four main windows that come up, we also have Launchpad, all right? Uh, I'm not gonna pull up here because there's so many windows that pop up and just on the little laptop, but if you run BLP on your terminals, and if you do that, and you can, and you can play around with it as well too, you're allowed to kind of, um, utilize a lot of different widgets I'll call them like different uh, screens from the Bloomberg so if there are you know more than four screens that you like to look at at once you can make smaller components and put them together and save that view on Launchpad so every time you run BLP that view will pop up for you so maybe there's you know a few intraday price graphs that you need to look at on this side you know a whole monitor of news over here three or four different functions that are really important to you that you want on the screen 
you could have that all on Launchpad. And then every time you run BLT, BLP, when you log into the terminal, your save view will be there. All right, so it's an important part. Clients love it now. If you go into the trading desk and stuff, you see all these monitors that are up there. They're using Launchpad. Even at the end of that video, the, the terminal that was showing up there has Launchpad, Launchpad on it for a lot of different monitors. All right. So along with Launchpad and the core terminal, which we'll mainly show you just some functions on the core terminal because you can pull them both into uh, both Launchpad and core terminal. The idea, the third area that you could use the Bloomberg is through our API. So a lot of the fields, a lot of the functionality, the data that you see on the Bloomberg terminal can be pulled into Excel and utilized there to build out more custom formulas. Maybe it's more custom sheets that our clients need to build out um, can be done there utilizing the data that they're you know, they're experiencing on the Bloomberg terminal. So for example, if you're on, on the terminal itself, if you ran FLDS, is a great way to just see what kind of fields are available out there. I happen to be on Apple stock right now. If I come down here and I just type in price, just as an example, you can see some of the fields that are available to you in FLDS, you know, I come back with the keyword of price. So like in the top part here, I can see PX last, the value all the way to the right, the ID that's associated with it. So it's important to know, because you can use this, you can pull this into Excel, but also later when Amanda kind of comes up and talks a little bit about our, our EQS functionality and some of our FA, it's these custom fields that you can use to build out formulas. All right? You can build out these formulas and save them onto the Bloomberg. Again, customizable based on all the information that we have in the Bloomberg, you can build out your own <laughs> fields and ratios. All right? But that's the whole concept of it. And all those IDs that you see there can be pulled into Excel and then also custom on the Bloomberg. All right? Cool. All right, so when we think about the Bloomberg itself, um, I just like to think of it as like five main aspects, again, just to kind of talk about it in general. Uh, first and foremost, you know, the, the terminal is all about transparency. Um, and they even said it in the video too, it was built around transparency. The fact that, you know, both the buy side and the sell side can see the same information updated live at the same time brings transparency to market. So it's really the backbone of the terminal itself. Everything up there for transparency. Uh, it even translates into our own jobs, and even our physical space. Um, if you work at a Bloomberg office, uh, everything's wide open. Uh, we sit much like you do, a little bit more space though, in between where we sit basically like you guys. Um, all the conference rooms are glass, everything's wide open, everything's very transparent. Um, Mike Bloomberg himself famously too will just sit in an op open office, no door. Um, everything is just supposed to be you know, transparent throughout the company. So, and, it, and it translates from the Bloomberg terminal out to the uh, culture itself. Uh, so transparency is huge. The second main aspect of the Bloomberg terminal is communication. It seems so simple in, its, in, its, in a sense, but communication. Uh, the fact that out of our 330,000 plus users on there can just pull up and communicate to each other is a huge sticky point of the terminal. The fact that if you're on the sell side, you can reach out to your customers on the buy side very easily. Um, if I pulled up all the uh, hits functions on here, the top hit function that we have in the Bloomberg terminal is MSG, which is literally email, messages, messages back and forth, form of communication. Um, the other way, and I like to translate it back to when I started college 10, 12 years ago, um, and on my dorm, on our freshman floor, I, I graduated from the college in New Jersey, so I stay school up north. And uh, we drew a line, we got a whiteboard, put a line right down the middle, put on our doors, about 50 kids on our floor. On the left side, we asked for your name, and on the right side, we asked for your AIM name, so your AOL Instant Messenger name, which we used back then. Um, and literally be able to communicate and build a whole chat room so I had everyone on the floor and be able to communicate to them. It's the same thing that's been in the Bloomberg, right? And now you're just talking about the most influential people in the world that are to be able to chat in there, right? So you could literally type IBGO on your Bloomberg, and if you knew the individual, you could type IB and send them an instant Bloomberg and be able to chat instantly to them on the terminal. Again, it seems so simple, but the fact that you're able to do that and talk about your trades and your research is a huge sticking point. Um, you can just see some of the like persistent chats that we have up there you know, throughout our teams, but it's the same concept to be able to go through there, even to our golf chat. We golf on Mondays. Thank you, Bloomberg. So, um, but you'll be able to do that, right? Instantly communicate with other parties at the company itself and through message. Um, and along with that, you could run, if you're on the Bloomberg, you could run bio. My bio is going to pop up right away, but you could run bio on a particular user. Again, you could get contact information for them. So you could run bio on a user, anybody up there to be able to, you know, have that contact information. And probably even more useful for, for you would be POP. I would remember this. Um, so if you run POP, it's just a people search on Bloomberg. All right, so if you had a contact that you knew of, you could search on there. Maybe it's just by things that they put in their bio, like their career, 
um, or just a keyword. But for your case as well too, you could also put in over here University of Maryland. There's one for College Park. What's that? There's one for College Park. Oh, okay. We'll come up uh, College Park, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so there you go. So you could type in for College Park. You got University of Maryland College Park. And hit go. And what we're doing is we're pulling up all the results over here that have in their bio pages that are working that have Bloomberg terminals with the education background when they put in for University of Maryland College Park. So a way to be able to network and to be able to reach out to individuals. You have all Bloomberg's in front of you. You can use this search as well too to see where you know individuals are in the uh, you know in the space over here using the Bloomberg. So it's all about transparency, about communication, be able to use that people search, uh, the bio, you know, message, IB, all comes back into the communication aspect of the Bloomberg terminal. Um, clients will have the terminal literally just be able to have that connection piece and be able to reach out right away on an IB screen to somebody. Uh, third, the third main aspect really of the Bloomberg terminal is, is data. And this is what we kind of talked about as well too. You guys were throwing out some useful pieces of information and the way to average cost of capital and beta, right? These are all great piece of information it's all about the data. This is really what the Bloomberg drives, uh, runs on. Um, it's all the information that we have, you know, sourced into there and that our clients could use. Whether it's on the terminal, even from our enterprise side, we have an enterprise solutions, which we, we offer data feeds, backend feeds um, of data information. It all drives off of that. So along with data, the fourth main aspect is news. And we talked about news. News is integrated heavily into the terminal. Um, if you are on the terminal right now, if you run NHGO, this is just all the headlines that are going to pop up that Bloomberg subscribes to. So run NH and give it a second. It'll all pop up. But you can run NH Go. Here we go. There's going to be a lot scrolling through. All right, because these are all the wires that we have, all the news feeds that are coming into the terminal that we could integrate with our data and that you could also click on and be able to view and read. And there's a lot. And it's scrolling nonstop. It's going crazy. Because um, we have a lot of different wires out there. You could filter it down further by using this three digit code in this column over here. So you can see the three digit code. So if I typed NH and then space BUS as an example, I forgot the N, NH space BUS, all I'm telling this is, all right, let's filter down all those news stories by the business wires specifically, all right? Business wires out there, a lot of companies put press releases out on the business wires, Berkshire Hathaway company. All right, so this is the business wire. So now I can see everything specific to that. All right, so the business, the, the NH shows you all the news headlines. You can filter it down by a specific wire. And I like to show it because you can run specific searches. You could run NLRT. NLRT is a news-related search, which allows you to search through all these headlines that are coming in. And what we can do is we could create a new one. So you could do a new alert. And you could go to this advanced editor. So I went to NLRT, new alert, advanced editor. And within here is a great way to be able to search through all those news stories that are out there to find something relevant for you. So if you're following a particular company, in this case we'll build something out for Apple and I'm looking for news on the iPhone X or the iPhone 8 that's coming out. Maybe it's something about a particular sector. You could do it in here and you can save these searches and you can run it and filter through all the news that we have you know, on the Bloomberg terminal. Um, you can literally come into keywords and I could type in iPhone 8. I can update that. <coughs> I could come over to the company itself, and in here I could type in Apple for the company and update that. So here I have keywords of iPhone 8. I have a company for Apple. It should pop up. There it is. So I'm on the company ticker. I could even drill down further if I knew on the news sources over here, if there was a specific <coughs> source that I wanted. We had that business wire. They even have all like local Maryland papers would be there as well. You could, you could filter in specific source. And as you're building it out, you can see on the bottom, this is the results of that search. So you're starting to narrow down everything that we have on the terminal, and you could really build these out by keywords, include, exclude keys, um, to really refine what you're looking for. All right, and it's a great way to be able to filter through the, the you know, amount of news that we have onto the terminal itself. So once you do this, you can save it, and then every time you run NLRT, let me just put a neat. So every time I run NLRT, I'm now going to have that search right on the top, which I could click into and run. And you'll have that search there for all the news stories, specifically for 
you know, iPhone 8 based on the wires that I had on the keywords. All right, so it's a great way to be able to filter through all this news because news is a huge part of the Bloomberg terminal. Um, it's really the, uh, you know, one main aspect that this was built around. And we'll show you some of it as well, too, because when we're talking about stocks and I'm on Apple right now, if you ran CN, so if I'm on first pull up and pull up a stock like Apple. So if you had Apple load it. And every stock that you have loaded at the top, so when you see Apple load at the top, the next function you run runs it on the last security that you had in the terminal, whether it was a stock or a bond or a commodity, whatever you run next is run off of that. So if I run CN Go, this is going to show me all the news stories that are specific to Apple. All right, this is just everything specific to Apple. It's a great way to at least get to a landing page there. All right, the NLRT that we set up, you could get really. You know, every wire code and very specific. This is just showing everything that's going in place with Apple. And obviously, they're releasing a new phone tomorrow. So there's a lot of news coming in. But it's a great way just to be able to run CN on a stock with all your company news. That's what it stands for. All right. Cool. So what we'll do is we'll show some more, like, top-level functionality, just some, like, higher-level uh, functions that you could utilize maybe in your research. And then we'll <laughs> dig into a few more specific equity functions using, like, two or three examples. Um, if you were just looking for the top news of the day, one of the most hit functions out there is literally Top Go. All right, again on the news side, to run Top Go, you can see all the important information that's out there for the day. Um, our customers love it, so when they walk in the morning and the boss is yelling at them and they know exactly what's going on in the market, they just run Top Go real quick. That's probably one of our highest hit functions. Uh, just to be able to see the news that's taking place. And related to it, and we're going to be talking more, you know, about stock-related functionality. But if you run Eco, Eco, Eco Go. This shows you all the really economic statistics uh, that are taking place. Um, but it, so this is all like the macro low view. So if I was looking at Lennar as a home builder, right, and you know EPS is important to me and their net income and how they're performing, but also statistics like you know new home starts and you know different things in a macro level view are important that I could find on EcoGo. Uh, so you could come into here, you know, you could see the different type of releases. Again, I could go over to the housing sector. I could go back in time. You can see all the different things that are coming out. Building approvals, dwelling starts, house price index. These are all different, you know, macro level that's coming either from like a government agency or a third party agency coming in to give you a statistics and a barometer around how the market's doing. So along with your actual stock research and equity level, you want to see what's taking place at a macro level. You can run EcoGo to kind of see a lot of statistics that are taking place. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Cool. All right, another cool thing I want to show, I'll start off by running HURR, it's our hurricane map, because it's one specific form of our map scale. So we have map scale. Um, but we're doing a lot of work at Bloomberg to kind of get our data sets onto map scale and doing more visualization of data itself. Uh, this is a subset of, subset of it called HURR, so you can just kind of see where the current hurricanes are because that's been popular in the news. Um, but using a lot of our commodity data as well, too, I could kind of overlay this of, in this case, all the oil refineries. Um, comes up a little blurry on the laptop. If on your desk and you can kind of zoom in, you know, here you can see all the assets that might be in the way of a storm in this case, right? Um, each one of those green dots, you can see if it's operational, who owns it. Um, if I'm doing a lot of investing in, like, Valero and they're down in the Houston area, maybe I need to hedge with somebody else who's at the northeast coast. Um, so you could kind of overlay this information. We're getting more and more data in there for visualization. And if you just run Maps Go in general, you could see some of the examples that we already have up there. So if you run Maps Go, there's already some sample maps that are loaded. And you can kind of see some of the information that we have, you know, people, sample maps that people have built out. Um, but it's another great way to just kind of, you know, tie together the information that we have, you know, along with putting it in a visual uh, aspect to it. So Maps Go is another cool high level thing to take a look at. So again on the high level aspect, let's just talk a minute about indices. All right. Does anyone know what an equity index is? We I mentioned before. So what does an equity index do? Why are they important? Does anyone know what they do? What's an what's an index? Equity index. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Summary of the market, the way it is, right? So it's, it's used as a barometer to how the market is. Um, it's also used a lot in benchmarking. So, right, it's just a way to say either the market's doing or maybe 
a sector or even a country in exchange is like the NASDAQ composite index because it has everything in the exchange. So good. So it's, you know, a way to kind of take a look at Mark and Hall. And when we think of the U.S., we think of like the S&P 500. What else? What other big one is out there? Dow 30. Yeah, Dow 30, <laughs> Dow Jones, right? So when somebody says, hey, how the market do today? We're really looking at indices. Or look at this kind of saying, well, the S&P was up, the Dow Jones was down. Um, so if you run, if I start typing in SPX, so I could find the S&P 500, you can see over here in securities, we find the S&P 500 index. If I click into this, I now have the S&P 500 loaded, all right? Instead of a stock up there, I have an index loaded. And I can run IMAP, IMAP. All right, so if you run IMAP Go, using this nice breakdown over here, this pie graph. Um, but what's cool about this is you can literally break down into the S&P 500 or any index that you have loaded up there. Again, we talked about the NASDAQ composite. You could pull up any index in this area, run IMAP Go. And what it allows you to do is drill down into each specific sector of the S&P 500 to see what's really driving the performance of that index. So even though the index is up about 1% today, and for the most part, everything's green. It's nice across the board in each area. You can see like the financials, for the most part, are kind of really pushing the weight of this index forward. Um, but there are some red, right? We could drill down. The nice part about this is I could hover over the pie where I see some red. I could drill into that to the consumer discretionary area. I could go into media. I could go all the way down to the cable and satellite area and click that. It's going to show me the specific stocks that kind of make up that particular sector of the S&P 500. And so from here, I could see on an individual stock level, you know, what's pushing, what's, what's driving the index for today or over a period of time. Um, so IMAP is a great way on the index level to kind of drill down into that and see it. If you're on an index, you could also run MRR. This is for member ranked return, MRR. I like using this personally, quite frankly, just to be able to pull up indices um, and just see it on a period basis. So right here, it kind of defaults to year to date, but you could type in any custom period that you want. And what this is doing is just showing you the top performers and the worst performers throughout that index. Again, whatever index that you have loaded onto the system, show you your top and worst performers over that period of time. Uh, so you can really understand what's driving these particular indices. All right, so you can see that on the S&P. If we were doing something like the, I started typing in stocks, this is a big European index. So SXXP. And then if I run MRR again, so I'm just on a different index now. Same concept though, you can see what the best you know, what the um, best performing and the worst performing stocks were in that particular index. And a great way to find overall indices is just kind of run WEI. This is a huge hit function on the terminal and just literally gives you a snapshot of what's going on for today. So how's it look today? Does it look all right? It's a lot of green. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's good, right? So this kind of gives you a snapshot across. And you can drill down to each of these areas too. It gives you an area, you know, if you want to drill down to EMEA or Asia Pacific region, if I click into that, I'll show you all the major indices out of that area. Um, just to get a great understanding, a high-level view of what's taking place in the markets. Um, WEI will be able to show you that. And if you click into one of them, it brings you back to that IMAP page <clears throat> that we were taking a look at before. So cool, cool function to just be able to play with. Uh, one other one I like to show, this is fun as well too, is BSV. So this is your Bloomberg Social Volatility uh, Monitor. And what we're doing in here is taking a look at a lot of the uh, movements in stocks for today. So on the right-hand side, it's showing you the news headline or even the Twitter feed, which I'll speak about in a second. That's kind of moving these, these company stocks over here in the second column. You can filter it by change for today. But you can see if there's something that came out, whether it's a big news or Twitter announcement, um, and it's moving the stocks, the prices of these different stocks, you can see this all on one page. This is another great way just to kind of understand what's taking place in the market for today, what's moving, who are your biggest leaders and laggers are. Um, so you can pull up BSV and be able to see that. Um, because we do have also Twitter integrated into here. So if I ran NHTW Twee, which is the Twitter wire, you can cover your eyes again because it's going to hurt because there's so much flowing in here. So we have <clears throat> whole Twitter handles uh, pouring in as a wire. So when we're looking at that NLRT before, you could use TWT wire, you could do your filter and search on that as well, too. All right, um, a few years ago, the SEC said that Twitter is an official means of dissemination for companies. Um, so we had to come around and make sure that was integrated into the terminal as well, too, to be able to pull out key pieces of information.
Um, it just shows you again how integrated it really is as far as the news and, and data side is concerned. So if you just want to see from a standpoint of what's going on in a market getting more towards specific equity functions, which we'll lead into, you could pull up EVTS. EVTS is just going to show you a nice broad view um, of what's going on as far as what companies are releasing and when their earnings calls are. All right, so every quarter here in the U.S., a company has to release out their financials to you, to the general public. All right, and they will do that through an earnings release. And then they follow it up with an earnings call. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take the top securities out over here. I'm just going to go back in time a little bit just so we could get more results. Um, but what we have over here is when the company's going to release and the earnings calls that are taking out. And the key piece of information that we have is all the transcripts here. So if you are looking for more information, um, really digging into a company and research on it, these are the earnings calls that follow the release. All right, so this is where a lot of the analysts get onto the call. They will ask questions. Somebody from the C-suite of the company is speaking about it. Future plans, company guidance. A lot of that is found in here. But EVTS is a great way to just load your portfolio. If you have a portfolio in here or a, a monitor of stocks that you're following, and just try to see when you know those companies are reported, when the next big event is coming out. For Apple, for on here, we have the you know the, the release tomorrow of the of the iPhone. Um, so that there is you know a great way to be able to see that across the board. All right. So I'm going to show one more higher level one. We'll dive into some uh, equity specific. But I want to show you Bix, B-I-C-S. If you run Bix Go, this is really the backbone of indices. Um, when we talked about the S&P 500 before, I'll do this drop down. They actually run off, they have their own, it's the Global Industry Classification System, which is called GIX. It's like an industry standard that's out there. We have Bix, which is the same exact concept, which is the Bloomberg Industry Classification. For all the public securities that are out there, we need classification behind them. So when we talk about Apple, yes, they're a technology company, <clears throat> but they're really more in the mobile phone space because more than half their revenue is coming from the iPhone itself. So it's a, a way to able to break that down on a hierarchy and to then see better which peers are associated with them. All right, and that's how the S&P 500 is built and all the different sectors that are in there. Again, we're talking about Lenar as a home builder, maybe somebody's in oil and gas, consumer discretionary. It's all filtered into this here. So you could kind of break down. You could click on communications, media, advertising and marketing, you know, advertising agencies. Click into that, and you can see on the right all 219 that fit into that category. But it's a great way to be able to also see who's, who are the players in your space. So if you have a stock, who are the, uh, you know, for relative value purposes, who else am I associated with? VIX will give a great hierarchy of this. And you can kind of drill down into those areas and get, on the bottom right, a whole list of those companies that are associated closely to yours. All right. So when we have that in place, we'll go to some equity functionality. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up Disney. I'm going to write DIS, pull up Disney stock. And we'll talk about some specific two companies now. <clears throat> so when I'm on DIS, the first and foremost function, if you remember, if there's anything you remember to pull out of here today, it's DES. This is your landing page, right? The description page, whether you're on an equity, which we're going to be in most of these cases here, or again, if you're on a commodity or a bond or mortgage, you run DES. It gives you a great background and a launch pad for all the other main functions that we have in the equity space. All right, so if I'm DES, right away on the top, I get a little description of what Disney is. On the left-hand side, I can see all the pricing information and some key piece information. In the middle, I have all the estimates data. And on the right-hand side, I can see all the corporate information as well. And all this I can kind of drive down further into. We have further tabs on the top of the ratios, industry info. But this here is the best landing page that you have. So as soon as you load a function, run DES, you're able to launch right from here. So if I click into this top here for GP, or if you just ran GP, you can get the price graph for Disney. Um, I like to show the GP graph because right on the top right, which is important and very easy to do is kind of click into this key events. <clears throat> so if you're doing analysis on your stocks, if you pull up a company and you pull in all these key events, it's a great way to see how the price of the stock reacts to different events. And you can scroll over and you can click into some of these. I highlighted this over here, this big green E was probably one of the last earnings releases. All right. And you can see there was a positive earnings release. So you could kind of click into these as well too and see the event. On the bottom too, you could also see the trading that's going along with it. 
if again, if I kind of click into this greeny, it's going to launch you to other functionality, right? So it's a great way right from the price graph itself to be able to see how the stock's moving and what might be associated with it. When I click into that greeny, it brings me to the ERN screen. So you can run ERN and it'll get you to the same spot. And in here, it's really just showing, and there's a lot on this page, but the main important information is this the SERP, the surprise. 1.94% surprise is a positive surprise. Um, so in that case, what it was doing was comparing to the estimate. And where does this estimate come from? Who's estimating this? This is what we think that the company is going to come out. <coughs> so there's a lot of on the sell side put out research, right? And they're putting out as far as everyone who's covering, all, all the research analysts, maybe 40 or so that are covering Disney, putting out what they think the estimate was for that particular period, $1.55. And their actual came out to be $1.58. So when the company reported, this is the value that came out, compared it over to what the street estimate was. This is the mean consensus of all the estimates that are out there. And this is ultimately what the surprise is. And it's important if they have a positive surprise, usually the stock's reacting positively to it. All right, if they have a negative surprise and they miss their earnings, the stock could go down. It's not always the case, but you know, it's a big part that goes into it. I mean, you can see that right away driving from the GP function. All right. Along with GP, I like to show GIP. It's literally, this is your intraday version of uh, GP. So we're just looking at the intraday graph. The stock's still ticking along right now since it's <clears throat> quarter to three in the afternoon. And you can see the intraday price graph for it. And what I'd like to show as an example, I'm going to go back in time, way back in time. I'm going back to 11-11-2010. And so this is Disney stock, GIP. And I just go back to November 11th, 2010, and we look at this. And it looks like the stock's, you know, chucking along all day, and we get towards the end of the day, and that happens. Does anyone know why that might happen? Why did this happen? What is this? Why would that, why would that go? If you own Disney stock, are you happy? I'm not happy. What happened? What could be a possible reason for that? It's a big jump down. Yeah. Press release, okay, what kind of press release? Earnings report. Earnings report? All right, that's, that's a good guess. In this case, it really was an earnings report in this one, so very good, good job. I don't even have to put out any other joke or anything, like Mickey running away or something. But So yeah, now in this case, right, and a good way to show this and why I like to show GIP is because we also have this, this news bar up here, and you can utilize it on either GP or GIP screen, but it's just great to be able to use because you can click off this news and you can slide this bar over, and wherever you want to put it onto a graph, you can click, and it'll show you all the headlines during that time. So I could go in there, and I could click, and it'll show me all the headlines popping up. Great way to just understand maybe what's going on with the chart, you know, why is this reacting that way, trying to stay ahead of the curve. Um, and you can see over here, Disney misses by one cent, by one cent. So they came out with their earnings. Um, it was below when we were looking at that ERN screen, and we saw what the estimates were on the street. Well, they, for this particular period, they missed that, all right? The company dropped down. But for this one, though, why, I guess the question I have is, when do companies usually put out their earnings? Like a company usually put out a press release for their earnings. Did they usually do it in the middle of the day like this? I like to do things around lunch. Do they do it around lunchtime? No. Why wouldn't they put it out in the middle of the day? Yeah. Right before, what did you say, right before? Okay, yeah, well in this case, what they want to do is basically right at the close, they basically want to put it out, right? So companies will put it out either before the market opens or after the market closes, because they actually want to avoid this, they want to avoid this happening. They want to throw volatility out there, exactly what you said. So like, you know, they throw it out in the middle of the day, and all of a sudden the stock's reacting to it, because you're just looking at some of these key pieces of information, you don't have the time to digest it. That's what happened over here, but with Disney's case, why well, I like to put it up is, at this time, Bloomberg was really ramping up all of our web crawling technology that we had, and we were web crawling. We web crawl all these uh, sites, so like Disney's website, whenever they're about to release earnings, and we ping it like crazy. Um, they actually put out their press release early by accident. Somebody, the poor soul at Disney, put it out early, and we got it. Um, and be able to put it on the Bloomberg, but this is what happens right away, right? So they actually miss their earnings. You don't really have a lot of time to digest the information and get the key pieces, the EPS out there. The stock reacts, all right? So they. Companies will try to put it out in the morning. Unfortunately for us, we have to cover a lot of it, so it's early in the morning or after market, because you don't want to throw volatility out there. You don't want, you don't want this to happen for the most part. 
All right, but it's a great way to be able to see what's going on too by using this news functionality. And I also like to throw out a, a question there too: Is uh, does anyone know who the largest shareholder of Disney stock was at this time, back in 2010? There was one person who owned more stock than anybody else. We could look if you type in HDSM, or HDS will get you there too. But HDSM this is our holding share matrix. All right, so you can run this on a particular stock, and it'll show you, you know, who's holding it. Obviously, a lot of the, if you ignore my uh, portfolio at the top for, for um, just whatever purposes. So you have uh, public portfolios under there, obviously, like your vanguards, but then what we have right over here, Warren Powell Jobs Trust. All right, well, back at the time, Steve Jobs is actually the largest shareholder of Disney stock. Does anyone know why? Yeah, Pixar. I heard Pixar. That's good. Yeah, so they had Pixar. So they had acquired uh, Pixar, um, and Steve Jobs became the largest shareholder of Disney stock when Disney acquired Pixar. Um, the, his widow actually just sold off half the amount of shares, so it back down to 63 million, but she was like 120 million shares at you know, $100 a share call. Not bad. Not a bad day. $6 billion day. But she's still up there. But you can see HDSM. Run that, you can see who the largest shareholders are. And it's important too, just kind of see who's coming in and out of this stock, right? Out of all these big uh, buy side firms are coming in and out. Um, so that will show you, HDSM will show you who's the uh, shareholders, largest shareholders of it. And we mentioned the actual acquisition. So a function called CACS, C-A-C-S, is our corporate action screen. So if you run CACS on the ticker itself, it's gonna show you all of our corporate actions. And this includes mergers and acquisitions, stock splits, Everything related to that, I could click off M&A, and I could go back in time. I'm just going to go back to um, 2006, just to be able to show you. All right, so I did a time frame of two months back in 2006, and you can see right over here, here's the acquisition. All right, so Disney's acquisition of Pixar, which I mentioned before. And I could click into this and actually see the terms of these deals. All right, so you could go and click into it. In this case, it's 100% stock, and that's hence why Steve Jobs became the largest shareholder of Disney stock. Uh, but you could click into that. It shows you all the corporate actions and the details behind it uh, for your analysis on, on the uh, CACS functionality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which one? This one here? You can run uh, CACS on a ticker. So CACS will bring up basically all the corporate actions. And there's filters on the top, so I, I filtered off just by M&A, if you see. And I just kind of narrowed the date range down, too, because I knew it was in 2006. But you'll be able to see there, and you can filter. So it has all different types of corporate actions on it. But CACS will get you on a ticker level. CACT is just kind of um, the same thing, but on a index level or your portfolio level. You can do, accomplish the same thing. Mm -hmm. But CACS will get you there. Cool. Any other questions? All right, I just want to show some more uh, equity functionality then because we're going to dive right into uh, Apple. So I'm going to pull up Apple. And the first one we want to pull up, and Amanda's going to help as well too. So we're going to pull up FA. So if you pull up FA on your terminal, this is your one-stop shop for financial analysis. And uh, Amanda's going to speak a little bit towards it. She's in that group. <laughs> All right, so um, like I was saying a little bit before, the financial anal analysis or FA function is where we house all of our fundamental equity data. Um, so this is the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, and any supplemental uh, financial data that a company will report at time of earnings or when they release their 10K or 10Q uh, with the SEC. So um, we take that and s align it up over time so that you get the full historical picture of uh, each of these statements and can compare the same line items across companies. Um, another cool aspect that we showcase is their segment data. So for Apple, rather than looking strictly at EPS or revenue, um, analysts at time of earnings are likely most uh, focused on 
their actual products. So how much revenue is iPhone <laughs> earning? How many units did they sell? What's the average price of each of those units? Has it increased or decreased over time? Um, so those are a little bit of a deeper dive into the financials um, of each company. And again, that'll differ by industry, oil and gas, or banks might have a lot different um, industry specific metrics like this. Um, and then just for to tailor this a little bit more towards um, what you guys will be using it for, this custom tab over on the right hand side, uh, can, you can pull in your own list of fields. So instead of using our predetermined income statement or balance sheet, you guys might want to use just a flat list of fields that are really definitive of the valuation that you'd want to be doing. So just as an example, um, I'm going to pull in like revenue and assets. And these can be um, downloaded straight into an Excel so that you guys don't have to mess with like the formulas of API and um, kind of building out your spreadsheet all together. More so you can take this, have the full string of history uh, straight into Excel and then start manipulating it from there. Um, and that's just through the output to Excel button. Um, but this isn't set up to download. Um, and then kind of going a little bit more off of the industry specific stuff that we were talking about. BI is our group at Bloomberg that does the research side of all of these companies. So one of our analysts will cover Apple and its industry. They'll do all of the in-depth research like a research analyst would, but doesn't give a buy, sell, hold like opinion. It's more so for kind of like knowledge purposes. So this is also where we can showcase these industry specific type things. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the market moving of the actual side. And then we talked about um, how earnings also relies on what it is compared to the estimate. So this is kind of melding the two together because it has um, some forward estimates of some metrics as well. Do document search. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, as Amanda said, I mean, this is a great spot to be able to see all these key metrics, right? So you have all the uh, average selling price of the iPhone. We know the iPhone revenue is important, but here's the average selling price, the shipments. You know, these are other key drivers when you're looking up these stocks, you know, that are really moving the price of it. So if you ran that BI and you clicked on an earnings analyzer, you'll be able to go right there and see that. Um, and they also put out company primers as well. It's just a great way to get a snapshot of the company. Um, you know, what's taking place in the big, you know, uh, events like uh, releasing the iPhone tomorrow. They got bits that are around it. Um, the information that you see on BI is very particular to that company. So it's a great, great spot to be able to go. So you just literally run BI. You know, you could type in the ticker at the top over there, search over on the company that you're looking for, and go to that earnings analyzer and check it out. Because uh, when you're also doing your research, one other main function that we like to at least introduce is, is DSCO. <laughs> Uh, DSCO is important. I mean, it's very simple in nature, uh, but powerful in the sense, too, they were able to search across all different type of documents that we have on the Bloomberg. So this is 8Ks, 10Qs, transcripts from the earnings calls. If you had access to certain research, it would be listed there as well, too. Presentations. And what you could do is literally do a keyword search across all of that. Um, so again, if we were looking at you know, iPhone X in this case, if that's what they're going to be calling it, um, and I type that in, what I could do is across all these documents that pop up, we could see where it mentions iPhone X. I could click into that. And it'll show me the exact location in the document. I know it's a little zoomed in on the screen here, but you could see where it's highlighted. And right behind it on the right here is the actual document itself. So you could see across keywords. You could search across industry. Um, I know in the healthcare industry is very important too. They can type in all the different drugs that are in the pipeline and see what competitors are talking about it as well too. Uh, but to be able to search across all those different documents in one area, DSCO will allow you to do that. Um, so whether it's average selling price, like Amanda was showing all those key piece information on the BI in the top, now you can search through it 
you know, across all the documents that we have on the terminal and see exactly where they disclose it in the 10Q. Where does it come from over here? And you're able to hone in on it real, real easily using DSCO. Um, so it's definitely a great functionality to be able to use and to, and to showcase. All right, cool. All right, so any other questions? All right, so we want to show one of the main one as well, and if you want to pull that up, I guess, and EQS is kind of really pulling together a lot of the uh, equity functionality that we have, uh, pulls together into our equity screening functionality. All right, and this here is be able to break down, uh, based on criteria, break down from a, from a higher level to a, a certain subset of tickers that you would like based on the criteria that we have. Um, want to show? Yeah, so Amanda's going to show that as well. So, yeah, just kind of wrapping up um, everything that we talked about, um, this is a good tool for either gathering investment ideas or just finding a universe um, of tickers that kind of match all of the different criteria you're looking for. Uh, so you could go by indice or by sector, country, um, really narrow down this universe that we have of 9,915,000 tickers um, into like what you're trying to look for. So just as in- So can you do like uh, the companies in the S&P 500 that are growing more than 20% and have an ROIC greater than 20%? Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> companies in the S&P, we first want to narrow it down by the S&P index. So using um, the autocomplete again, we can select that uh, and then Grow, or revenue growth, revenue growth. we have revenue we can write growth afterwards year over year greater than and again these are all depending on the field it'll let you either select the option to display on the um, screen when we see results or you could add criteria to like narrow down the universe so in this case we'll do it by 20 as she's typing in the criteria, it's going through all the list of fields that we had. So like in the beginning when we looked at FLDS, it's basically going through that whole function and seeing what we have, you know, matching for that. Yeah, and then again, you can see that it's going from the 505 companies in the S&P um, down to 70 with the revenue growth that matches the 20% criteria. Um, did you want total return or ROIC? ROIC, great latest filing. Cool. Display. Uh, greater than 20. Yeah. Again. Cool. And then we get to seven. So you can see that adding these two has really narrowed down our universe. If that's something that your investment strategy might be based on is having these two growth numbers met, then there you go. You have uh, the list of companies that suit that strategy. In the results, you could also, in the actions, you could actually send it over to PRTU. You can make a portfolio out of it. So if you go down and do output, you can make a monitor. So you have your results, and then you can send it over to one of those. So if you send it to your portfolio and save it, and you run PRTU, it will also be listed there for you. Um, or same thing, same concept with the monitor. Where's the monitor do? It's for Launchpad. Okay. So yeah. this, say if you are managing... You, I know you all are going to manage a portfolio within the class, I believe is one of the projects. Um, if you have this type of list in any of these functionalities, whether it's in a portfolio or in Excel, that can be managed then on Launchpad so that you can kind of see it tick away while you have your Bloomberg up, as John was saying with Launchpad earlier. Um, and then one other functionality within EQS uh, is this formula. So if you go back to the main EQS screen and hit formula up in the upper left, you can again use that database of fields that we have to create formulas per analysis done in this class. So one of the measures that you'll be creating for this class is NOPAT, which is net operating profit after tax, and that's using EBIT. So I'm gonna search for that. It, fi it found that field for me, um, and I can change it to an annual value, and it can add, it'll add it straight into this formula, and then I can perform any other functions on it. So like add, subtract, 
Um, in this case, I want to multiply it by 1 minus the tax rate. So uh, autocomplete works within this as well. And I can add that in. And now within my equity screen, I can call upon this field and add, uh, or add it to my results page. So I, that's something else that um, will be utilized in this class. So, any questions on that? And they have to save it and name it. Yeah. yeah, save it and name it so that you can use it going forward. And then you can use it. Doesn't like to find it. There it is. It typically comes up in the autocomplete. It might just, you know, it might need to reload the page or something for it to find it. But. Yeah. <coughs> Any questions on that? Christine. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, this class was till three fifteen. Yep. There you go. Okay. Is there any general questions about anything yeah, so over here on the terminal? Covered or not? So I will go over some quick recruiting opportunities. And now you all should have a really good understanding of the terminal itself, the scope, exactly what we do, how we do it, all that good stuff. And now we'll touch a little bit on what is Bloomberg from a cultural perspective, right? What is Bloomberg from a potential recruiting opportunities perspective, all of that good stuff. So. We're a high-tech, market-moving, data-driven company. I think you all know by now that the reason behind the terminal was to bring transparency into the market, right? They wanted buy side, Mike wanted the buy side and the sell side to be able to, one, communicate with one another, but two, also be able to have that access to information and have that transparent marketplace for other people. So a way he took that even further was through the transparency into our own open environment. So all of our offices are open space. We sit trading floor style. Even Mike actually sits on the fifth floor of our Lexington, New York office right in the open. He's super engaging. And if you go up to him and talk with him, he's more than happy to talk with you. I manage all of our interns as well over the summer. And we had a number of interns that went right up to him and had a, a great conversation on Mike, with Mike. Um, so he really wanted that culture to be present throughout all of Bloomberg. So a couple key things on that is that we don't have any formal titles. So you notice that we have a couple of data analysts here, and yes, we have team leaders and managers in that respect, but you know, John has been here for 10 years now, Amanda is closing in on her one year mark, and they're both considered market data analysts in our field. And that really speaks to our culture because we want people to go beyond their actual job title, right? You always should be reaching for more responsibilities, asking for more tasks <laughs> to do. And that's how you, we measure growth year after year. Um, and having no titles and being able to really communicate with anyone from any level is, one, is a way that we do that. And we don't have the sound hooked up still, do we? Yeah, it's yeah, okay. Oh, cool. So I'm gonna show you this quick video. On Bloomberg. Actually, I don't know. Uh -uh. There we go. Chrome. I think it pulled up the, the Internet Explorer. I feel like it pulled up Chrome. Chrome one. 
Is that what it? There we go. So here's a quick video on our culture, and as you saw, the terminal kind of possesses all of these similar qualities. But this is what it's like to work what at Bloomberg. What is Bloomberg? Well, um, I can tell you what it's not. It's never dull. Bloomberg is... Bloomberg is a high-tech... Market-moving, data-driven... Cross-platform... Information company. When we're busy moving the global financial markets... Bringing transparency to business... And helping major players change the world... We go through a lot of coffee. A lot of coffee. Yeah. I, uh, I like grabbing a free snack with colleagues from other teams and other countries. It helps you get a fresh perspective. Well, it's about collaboration. Across teams. New ideas can come from anywhere. It's uh, Bloomberg is the most inspiring place to work that hasn't been discovered yet. Wow. wow. Bloomberg supports my volunteer work. Which is refreshing. Yeah, and there are many opportunities to give back. The company is designed to solve global problems. Like, like climate change. This is a great place to be if you care about doing good. We, we don't, don't think small. Diversity is essential for business success. When we're moving this fast, it's great to know your employer has your back. The benefits are excellent. We take that basic nugget of information from the financial market and push it out across all our channels. Nanoseconds matter. Faster, but also smarter than anyone else. And we have people answer questions they didn't even know they had. It's all about smart speed. We're passionate about connecting the world with news, analytics, data, seeing every angle. We're the fastest, real time, borderless, most caffeinated organization in the world. Information is everything. I see my ideas come to life. My work really matters. Did I mention never know? <laughs> so a couple of things. What did you guys pull out from that video? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. You know, embracing a collaborative environment, a lot of diversity, and all people speaking different genders, you know, uh, races, ages. Um, everyone just kind of come together in a transparent environment where you learn and grow from one another to just create a better product. That's perfect. That's exactly. I don't think I could have touched on anything else. That was the best answer I've ever received. But yeah, I touch on trans, uh, transparency, right? Collaboration, having every single academic diversity background in the office because that's what's really essential to our main product, the terminal. Um, and I will go over a couple of our recruiting opportunities. If you really find yourself that you know this speaks to you. This could potentially be for you. So, who in the room is sophomores, juniors, seniors? Who's a junior here? Okay, cool. Seniors? Nice. Well, congratulations. You guys are almost there, but you still have this full <laughs> year to go, so please don't take it lightly. Um, but you'll see that we have a couple different opportunities based on your year. So, for those of you that are juniors, we offer a 10-week internship program that runs from June until August. And we have a couple of different hiring departments for that. We have our global data department, which is responsible for all the financial data that feeds the terminal. So all of these guys are in our global data department. That's what Amanda and Jesse interned in and then received their full-time offer. We have our sales and analytics department. So John mentioned this, that if you press the help help key twice, that generates a chat. That chat is then routed to an individual on our analytics desk. And the long-term goal of that position is actually a sales opportunity. So if you're interested in the financial markets and you're really you know, engaged with helping people and you wanna be in front of clients 24 seven, the analytics and sales internship could be a really great home for you. We also have our Bloomberg intelligence position available for interns only for juniors. And this is the BI function that was mentioned before. They're our neutral research unit to Bloomberg, and they essentially will build out different company primers throughout their internship. So what you saw actually right up here in the whole primer and earning an earnings analyzer screens, those are what our Bloomberg intelligence interns do, and that equates also to a full-time offer should you be successful in the internship. So for summer interns, all of these positions are posted on Hire Smith. Similarly with the seniors and graduates. So we have our full-time roles also available for you seniors for our global data and sales and analytics department. So for the global data department, that's based out of Princeton, New Jersey. And the sales and analytics department is based out of our 731 New York office. 
And you'll find all of these roles based on Hire Smith. Or if you signed into one of our iPads, then I will blast out these direct links for you guys so you can apply directly if you really you know, are engaged, if you like what you saw here, if you think Bloomberg is a cool place to work, which I think we would all agree with that, that it is. <laughs> um, we're more than happy to answer any questions that you might have on there. So. Any questions for any of us or anything that you wanted to go over before we let you guys go? All right. Uh, thank you. All right. Well, thank let's uh, thank uh, the Bloomberg team for coming in today.